morning, everybody. Uh, a quick COVID update, but more importantly, I'm here with a Mag Morelli uh, representing the Nursing Home Association and a Pat Charmel from Griffin Hospital because we have an important announcement we want to make in terms of hospitals and our nursing homes. But first, a quick look at where we are on COVID. Uh, still at 23% um, infection rate, a high infection rate, uh, about the same as where we've been for a week. So perhaps it's flattening out, if that's good news. Um, we saw what happened in South Africa, went, went up and down quite quickly. That was Omicron. And uh, Manisha Jutani, our Commissioner of Public Health, says about 90% of our infections are Omicron. Uh, we see what's happening in London. We see what's happening in New York City, where uh, hopefully you see some flattening of the curve there. Um, time will tell, but we still have to be prepared. But I thought that Omicron was um, less, um, less dangerous. Why do we have uh, our hospitalizations continuing to go up? I think there are a, a number of reasons for that. One, just because we have so much infection um, in our state. Uh, number two, there's a fair number of breakthrough infections, but mainly it's the unvaccinated. 10% of the people are creating 70% uh, of the folks who uh, go into our hospitals. And uh, that's something we really have to pay attention to. And finally, um, about a third of the folks who go into the hospitals are related to other surgeries say hip surgery, for example, not in my case, but other cases. So they're listed as a COVID patient, but probably they're there for other reasons. So I still like to think that in hospitalizations, we're doing relatively well. ICUs, we still have a pretty good capacity there as well. Um, and fatalities, thank God, are uh, still uh, low compared to where we'd otherwise be a year ago. And that's all thanks to the vaccines and, um, and the masks. Uh, that reminds me that compared to 2020, we're so much better positioned than we were before. Again, with uh, almost all of our people with the two doses of vaccine and uh, about 35, 40% with a booster. We're going to talk about that in a minute, what a difference that can make. And we've handed out uh, millions of N95 masks, the most secure masks for those folks uh, mo most at risk to make sure they could be taken care of. Um, with a lot of talk about testing, as you probably know, we've ramped up the um, rapid test dramatically in the last week. Uh, almost 2 million tests have been distributed, uh, the rapid at-home tests. In addition to that, PCR tests with our vaccination sites all over the state. Manisha says we're at 250,000 and growing for the PCR tests as well. And our run rate, we hope, will be, um, you know, one and a half, two million as time gets going until the White House and the federal government gets our allocation on a regular basis. The only thing I'd urge is um, if you're feeling good, you don't have to test every day. Uh, take a break. Let those folks who maybe feel like they've um, uh, got an infection of some sort, maybe they have flu, maybe not, let them get to the front of the line. Even if you think you have flu-like symptoms, it's probably COVID. Go home wait a few days, and then on day five, uh, get the test and hopefully be able to get back to work. Uh, the other thing we've got to do is continue to enforce uh, the mass mandates that we have in place. As you know, um, everybody in our schools, K through 12, uh, those students are required to wear a mask. And I'd say overwhelmingly, uh, they are doing so. In our um, public um, uh, transportation, rail, air, masks are required. Overwhelmingly, people are doing that as well. I worry a little bit about the informal contacts you have at stores and restaurants and bars where um, the rule is quite clear. If you're unvaccinated, you should be wearing a mask. And, uh, and that, that's by order. And uh, I'd like to ask our um, partners there to be a little more diligent in um, putting up the sign, reminding people this is important and this is how we can keep an um, all your customers and employees safe. In the meantime, when I go into a congested area, I always wear a mask. I just think it makes the most sense. But the news I really wanted to talk to you about is nursing homes and hospitals. Uh, nursing homes, as you remember, where we were particularly hard hit a year and a half ago, suffering real fatalities. And um, we can't let that happen again. And um, it's not. Right now, our fatalities are uh, relatively low, much lower uh, today than they were a year and a half ago, much lower. That's because um, you know almost all of our um, residents are vaccinated. The vast majority are boosted. Uh, almost all of our nurses are uh, vaccinated, but not that many of them are boosted. 
So our announcement today is the fact that um, uh, we're issuing an executive order uh, this evening that says we want all of the nurses at the nursing homes uh, with a third shot, which I consider fully vaccinated, that third shot, the booster, by February 11th. Now that will be made, pay dramatic dividends. That will open up capacity in our hospitals, make it easier for us to transfer people from the hospitals uh, to the nursing homes uh, and allow us to get back to more regular and normal hours in our nursing homes. And Amag will be able to tell you a little bit about that. And finally, Pat Charmel is here from Griffin because we're doing this alongside our uh, hospital partners. Our hospital partners are doing the same. Uh, for all hospital staff, they are going to mandate the booster. They are going to mandate the shot as well to make sure that um, they have more people able to be in the hospital, less people having to quarantine at home. That's how we keep our nursing homes safe. That's how we keep our um, hospitals safe. That's how we have the capacity to take care of each and every one of you. So with that, let me introduce uh, Mag Morelli from uh, Leading Edge Connecticut, the leading um, association of uh, nursing homes. And you're on mute. Mute. Sorry about that. Thank you, Governor Lamont. Um, I'm so pleased to be here today. You know, Connecticut's aging services workforce has been amazingly resilient in the face of this pandemic. Our nursing home staff have become expert at, in COVID-19 infection control, and they're doing an excellent job right now in protecting their residents, often under extremely stressful circumstances. You know, it truly takes a village for, to care for a nursing home residents, and every member of the direct care, housekeeping, dietary, administration, and clinical staffs are invaluable to the delivery of high quality nursing home care. So we must do what we can to support them and to protect them. And the vaccine and booster are an important part of that protection. That's why I'm pleased to be here with my colleague, Matt Barrett from the Connecticut Association of Healthcare Facilities. We saw firsthand what the initial original vac vaccine clinics did for our members and for their residents. And we continue to educate our staff on the importance and the value of getting vaccinated and boosted. So thank you for having us here today, Governor. Thanks, Mac. Pat, what are the hospitals doing? Hey, thank you, Governor. Uh, you know, back uh, in the summer, uh, after being presented with clear evidence that COVID um, vaccines uh, prevent transmission, hospitalization, and death from COVID-19, the Connecticut Hospital Association on behalf of its members uh, took a leadership position not only here in the state but uh, across the country by adopting a mandatory vaccination policy which has led to 99 percent of hospital caregivers being vaccinated but as you know and you spoke to it um, you know there's new evidence that's saying the effectiveness of vaccines does wane over time and caregivers in connecticut uh, were some of the first to be vaccinated so uh, given the compelling evidence that um, booster doses, uh, especially for those who've seen the effectiveness of their initial vaccination wane, uh, it does prevent serious illness. So the hospitals have, uh, through the association, have today modified their mandatory vaccination policy to include boosters, which we will begin to roll out. Uh, and in many cases, hospital caregivers have been uh, lining up for boosters, our percentage is pretty high, but adding it to the policy to make it mandatory will get us to the same levels that we saw with the initial vaccination. And uh, you know, we think it sends an important message, not only to uh, the general public, but to other employers who did follow our lead after our mandatory vaccination policy was adopted back in the summer. So we're pleased to support this effort. We're glad to see that our nursing home colleagues are supportive as well. And you know, again, want to thank you for your leadership um, and to encourage vaccination, supporting the vaccination and testing effort. Uh, it's made a tremendous difference. Hey, thank you, Pat. And um, batting cleanup and backed by popular demand is Deirdre Gifford, our commissioner of um, Department of Social Services. Why are we doing this, Deirdre? Thanks, Governor, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Pat and, and Mag and Matt, uh, for your partnership and um, your ongoing work in this area. So just to build on uh, what the governor talked about, what, uh, what actions is the state taking uh, today? 
Um, the governor will be issuing an executive order that will require a booster for staff and contractors in long-term care facilities that have um, uh, any kind of significant resident uh, contact. So uh, that includes not only our nursing facilities, but also um, assisted living and ma managed residential communities. It includes our residential care homes, um, our intermediate um, care facilities, and our chronic disease hospitals. These uh, uh, facilities were part of the initial executive order requiring um, a vaccine and uh, the booster requirement will be added uh, to that amended executive order. Um, there will not be an option for these employees to take a test um, uh, as, uh, as an alternative to the booster. They will be required to have the booster. And as the governor mentioned, um, the implementation date is about uh, February, is February the 11th. Um, <clears throat> uh, the reason why we're taking this step is, as you've heard, is we really have started to see an uptick in our cases in both uh, staff and residents of long-term care facilities. And um, thankfully, because of the very high level of uh, booster and vaccination that we see in our long-term care residents, uh, we are not seeing the kind of uh, really significant morbidity we saw in the first two waves of the pandemic, but we are seeing cases go up and we wanna do whatever we can uh, to prevent that. Uh, we have had, uh, for example, staff cases um, in our nursing homes have risen um, to 1,400 this week from about 700 last week. So a doubling of staff cases. Resident cases have also gone up to 632 um, in the most recent week compared to around 200 in the prior week. So we are seeing um, it rises and, and we think that we know that um, in order to be maximally protected from the Omicron variant, um, we need to have our staff and residents boosted. We are over 80% of our residents in long-term care facilities that are boosted, which is terrific. And that's due to a lot of hard work and dedication on the part of our vaccinating partners, our nursing home staff, our, our nursing home administrators. Um, but we haven't seen that kind of really significant uh, level of booster shots in our long-term care staff. So that's why um, we think this mandate is another really important tool in our toolbox to protect these most uh, vulnerable residents from uh, any further adverse impacts uh, from Omicron. And the last thing I wanna say is that, um, you know, as we think about protecting these, uh, these residents of long-term care, um, I, I'd like to just remind families and visitors uh, to these facilities that it's also really important for you to be fully vaccinated and boosted if you're going to visit loved ones um, in the facilities. Um, in addition to wearing masks and staying home if you don't feel well, uh, making sure you report any symptoms to the, the facility staff, it really helps us protect our nursing home and long-term care residents if visitors are also fully vaccinated and boosted. So I would make that request to those of you who are uh, visiting our residents and nursing homes. Back to you, Governor. Well, thanks, Deirdre. Also on the screen, you see uh, Jennifer Jackson representing the hospitals, Matt Barrett representing uh, nursing homes, Manisha, who you know, public health, and uh, Josh Jabal that does everything else. For our members of the press, we invite you to please use the hand raise function. We will try to get to as many questions as we reasonably can. Uh, we will start with uh, Ken Dixon from Hearst, Connecticut Media. Thanks, Max. Uh, Governor, I hope your uh, hip's doing okay today. Um, you. Uh, do you think that this ex new executive order should have been issued a week ago, or, or uh, are you second guessing uh, yourself at all on this? Well, we're the second state in the country to do it, and they we're doing it um, alongside, uh, I believe, Massachusetts is about to make a declaration as well, and I think some of our other neighboring states. Ken, we thought it was better to do, um, you know, as part of a group, um, but you can always do things earlier. Uh, thanks, Governor. Um, Dr. Juthani, um, it's about, a, about seven fatalities a day. Um, oh, no, 17 deaths a day over the last week. Uh, when do we, when do you start 
really worrying about a, a rising death rate? Well, we've certainly seen uh, deaths going up slowly, but what we have to remember is that our deaths this year during this week are about a third of the number of deaths we had in a comparable week last year. And that is due to the tremendous efforts towards vaccination and boosting, which is protecting the vast majority of our residents. For people who are boosted, many people are having mildly symptomatic disease, some are even asymptomatic. People who've been vaccinated but not boosted are having more significant symptoms but are still largely protected. What we have to worry about are the unvaccinated. And as the governor said, about 10% of the population is accounting for roughly 70 percent of our hospitalizations and certainly the people in our ICUs. So it is a concern, but I think for people who've been vaccinated and particularly those who are now up to date, as CDC is calling it in their vaccine series, this isn't something that we need to worry about to the same degree. But if you're unvaccinated, I would be concerned and I would strongly consider getting vaccinated while you can. Thanks. And finally, Josh, um, the Better Business Bureau today um, warned um, consumers about uh, people selling fake COVID tests. Are you seeing any reports of that in Connecticut? Uh, Ken, we have not heard of any such complaints at this point. Um, the vast majority of our procurement efforts of the, the tests that we're uh, providing at this point are also coming directly from the manufacturer, so that shouldn't be a concern, but we'll certainly keep a close eye on it. And if anyone encounters uh, any concerns on that, we definitely encourage them to report them to us. Thanks, folks. We'll move next to Paul Hughes, the Waterbury Republican American. Uh, thanks. Uh, what's, uh, and I'm not sure if I, I heard this right, uh, when, when's the deadline for hospital employees uh, that are going to be covered under this booster mandate to uh, comply? And basically, what's the percentage of hospital employees that will have to, that, that this will apply to? Yeah, I, I can answer that. Uh, and I, Jennifer may want to jump in. So it applies to all hospital employees. Uh, you know, boosters, this is going to depend on eligibility. As you know, Pfizer vaccine, individuals that, that have received two doses of the Pfizer mRNA vaccine are eligible to be boosted five months after their second dose of vaccine. Um, and uh, for, you know, the other mRNA vaccine, it's six months is the same for Johnson & Johnson. So this is going to be a rolling requirement based on eligibility. And you know it will take about 45 days uh, for hospitals to accomplish this, as Jennifer and others have mentioned. Um, you know we have to stagger the um, boostering of our employees just because we want to manage any potential side effects. As you know, hospitals across the state are full, and then some, including our ICUs. So if we have critical care nurses, we can't afford to have them out for a day or two following uh, following a booster if they have some mild side effects. So if that were to occur, we do want to st stagger it. So we suspect by March, we'll have uh, all of those employees that are eligible uh, to have their booster. And then as others become eligible, uh, we'll give them a little bit of time to uh, get their booster vaccine. As I mentioned in my opening remarks, uh, we've been very successful with our mandatory vaccination effort. We've got over 99% of hospital employees across the state uh, have received full vaccination. So we expect similar success with uh, our booster requirement. Um, I have a question maybe for Dr. Juthani. Um, in terms of booster shots, you know, we've had, I don't know, Josh probably had to figure out, but I think the last time was about 120,000 people had a Johnson & Johnson um, shot in Connecticut. And I'm assuming those many who got a booster shot chose an mRNA vaccine. Uh, but because of Johnson & Johnson was a single dose, are the recipients of the J&J &J shot who get an mRNA shot less boosted, say, than people who received three shots of the Moderna or the uh, Pfizer? 
So Paul, this is a great question. And I think I'm waiting to see some follow-up science on this question as well. So what we know is that for people that got Johnson & Johnson, although the recommendation is that people should get a booster after two months, most people got a booster after many more months than that, probably closer to five or six months. And then the question now, and this really pertains to about 16 million people in the country, is whether they need another mRNA shot. And I think the question will be probably best answered by follow-up data from the NIH study that gave us some of those initial recommendations. And I'm unaware of follow-up data that has been published on that yet. I'm looking forward to seeing that as well. I do think that will probably give us the clearest indication as to when the group of people that did what we asked them to do, which is get the first available shot to them, those that got J&J &J and have now taken a follow-up shot, when they and if we'll need another shot thereafter. So I don't have a great answer as to whether they should, when they should do it yet, but I too am looking forward to seeing that data. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. We'll go next to Hugh McQuaid, CT News Junkie. Thanks, Max. Uh, Governor or Josh, are you guys considering extending a similar sort of requirement for state employees and teachers and education workers and those folks? You want to start with that, Josh? Sure. Um, you know, it's certainly something we're considering. Uh, we wanted to focus initially here on the uh, facilities and populations that um, directly care for the most at-risk um, individuals in the most high-risk settings. And so that's where we're starting to focus. Um, you know, we're also cognizant of the fact that the governor's um, emergency powers will be expiring in the middle of February. And so, um, you know, as we look at the current situation, uh, we want to get this in quickly. Uh, we may need support from the legislature to do anything beyond that if we circle back around for state employees. But independent of a mandate, everything that you've heard so far from our Commissioner of Public Health, from our, our hospital executives, our nursing home executives, obviously applies to all the rest of our state employees, as well as every other resident of Connecticut, which is that if you get your booster, you're going to be um, very well positioned against this variant. Um, and we really strongly encourage everyone to go out and get it, even if you don't have a mandate on you. So the plan then is even despite the current uh, Omicron spike to let those emergency powers expire next month? We're talking to the legislature about that. We are going to put forward a, a group of executive orders we'd like them to opine on, like them to uh, allow to continue, um, but that's uh, in discussion. Okay, thank you. We'll go next to Dave Altamari, Connecticut Mirror. Thanks, Max. A um, Couple of questions, if I may. Um, uh, why has there not been any thought to reopening the COVID recovery centers that we had the last two surges, the one in Meriden and I think the others in I think one was in Bridgeport and Sharon. Has that been discussed or why not reopen them to alleviate some of the cases that we're seeing? Well, I can start with that, then hand it to somebody uh, in the nursing home industry. But um, one of the things we need are people. We need um, nurses able to uh, be, be back on the battlefield. And that's one of the reasons we're putting in place this mandate. So the hundreds of ones that are um, you know, now in quarantine, we'll be able to get back. We're sort of limited in terms of personnel. We do have isolation and wings and the such in our existing nursing homes. But um, Mag or Matt, would you like to take that? Well, first of all, you know, we've been working, Matt and I have been working very closely with the hospital systems to try to help with the throughput of, of uh, residents, uh, patients who need to be discharged to subacute uh, setting in the nursing home. Um, a lot of factors come into play there, but we have, and we have talked about whether or not we're going to need a COVID recovery unit. That's something that's not done in isolation. That's something that's done in partnership with the state. So we're, we're on a, you know, continuous conversations about it, but as the governor's right, it's, it's difficult right now to staff a nursing home. It would be difficult to start to staff a, a brand new nursing home. So, um, that idea is there, but it just has not come forward uh, to fruition yet. Matt, I don't know if you have anything else to add to that. No, I think you and the governor um, said it all, Meg. Uh, it, it, there is a clear issue related to staffing, but I don't see the issue ruled out completely. We're monitoring hospital capacity uh, slowly. We're getting reports on hospital capacity from the Department of Public Health. 
and I think we need to just continue to watch this closely. But but uh, standing up a facility, we are just in a different place uh, on staffing issues than we were in the earlier part of the pandemic when COVID recovery facilities, first in the nation, uh, here again in Connecticut, um, um, were, were, were a great option for us. Uh, we're watching the issue carefully, and I, uh, we could move in that direction, but I don't think we're ready to make that decision now. Um, my second question, my understanding is that a lot of the transmission in nursing homes is being caused by visitors. Has there been any discussion about mandating visitors be vaccinated? Well, I can start with that. Um, I talked to uh, the White House about that last week. I said... Um, one of the causes of uh, the big spread in the nursing homes is people from the outside bringing it in. And uh, so from my point of view, I'd like there to be a vaccination or at least testing before people go in. There's some uh, laws in terms of access. So we're trying to uh, discuss that with the White House right now, but I think it makes the most sense. Uh, and then my last one, this was for a bunch of the providers that have called me today. Um, what happens uh, with this guidance that was issued this morning? Uh, what happens if a nursing home uh, says they will not take a COVID positive patient? Matt or Mag or Josh, who's got that? Happy I to take that. Go. Thanks, Matt. Go yeah, I think I can say uh, really clearly, Dave, that. Um, the guidance that came out today, we don't interpret it on uh, 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 initially reading it uh, as in any way undermining a nursing home's very appropriate uh, authority and ability to refuse a hospital admission if the nursing home believes it is unable to meet the care needs of the resident due to staffing issues. And staffing issues are present all across uh, the state and especially in Connecticut nursing homes. And so we don't view the memo that came out today or the guidance document from the Department of Public Health uh, in any way, shape or form undermining that clear authority. And maybe put a different way uh, and uh, maybe stated even more uh, uh, unequivocally, we don't view the memo in any way as, as requiring a nursing home to accept a COVID positive um, uh, admission uh, from a hospital setting. It just doesn't say that. Thank you, I'm all set. Move on next to Eliza Fawcett with the Hartford Current. Thanks so much. I just wanted to confirm, what is the current percentage of workers in nursing homes and then separately in hospitals who are boosted? 31% in nursing homes. Hospitals, do you guys know? Yeah, Jennifer, you may want to take that. Uh, I'll just give a high level that it varies between, from facility to facility across the 28 facilities in the state. Um, you know, it's high as 60 to 70 percent of eligibles in some hospitals, uh, but it's, you know, in the, I would say, 35 to 50 percent uh, in general. I think that's My, right. Uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to confirm what Pat said. Um, and part of that, we actually think the number is higher, that we have staff that may have gotten their booster elsewhere. So as we implement this new policy, part of that will be tracking and getting better numbers for you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and then, Governor, so given the high hospitalization numbers we're seeing right now and strain on hospitalization on hospitals across the state, what's the rationale for, for still not instituting a statewide mask mandate? Well, as I alluded to, Eliza, um, First of all, I think we ought to be strict in terms of making sure that those who are unvaccinated are wearing their mask. And uh, we've been a little casual about that. I think we should be stricter. You know, we have a mask mandate at the Excel Center. There was a big basketball game. And let's say, uh, what a generally not everybody was wearing their mask. So it's a question about uh, not simply having a mandate, but be able to enforce it, making sure people, uh, you know, follow the lead. But um, so at this point, I'd like to say that uh, we still have capacity. I tried to describe why um, some of the capacity we have control over in our hospitals, but it's something we look at every day. So do you see the enforcement as primarily being in the realm of businesses? Yeah, look, um, we don't have enough municipal police. We don't have enough state police or uh, public health departments that our uh, municipalities are busy getting people tested and vaccinated. 
So I, I'd like to see a little more self-policing at the uh, restaurants and stores. Look, I like to go to a restaurant or store where people uh, ask me whether I've been vaccinated, or at least I see a sign that say, um, if you're not vaccinated, please wear a mask. Thanks so much. We'll go next to John Craven, News 12. Hey everybody, um, do we have numbers on how many uh, residents in long-term care are, uh, vac are boosted? We do have that. Yeah, 82% of eligible residents have been boosted in nursing homes. And is there anything that you guys can do in terms of, you know, I don't know, requiring more of them to get, get boosted? I don't, I don't know if that's even allowed. I think at this point, we are continuing our efforts in places where there may be lower rates and continuing to highlight the benefits of being up to date in your vaccine series. And at the end of the day, we're seeing that that has had a positive impact in the care of these residents overall. Move along next to Sue Haig of the Associated Press. Uh, thanks, Max. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Governor. I hope you're feeling well. Um, I just want to clarify something. Will the executive order require the hospitals to the workers to get vaccinated or is it just the nursing homes and the other um, entities that were mentioned earlier? Uh, we are, the executive order is directed at the uh, uh, nursing homes, elderly care, and the hospitals are doing this voluntarily on their own. Okay, great. Yes. And I'm sorry. Sue, sorry, just to, to supplement that, um, you know, we have about 3,600 state employees as well who work in hospital settings. For example, Connecticut Valley Hospital, um, Whiting Forensic Hospital, and some others um, who are also included in that first executive order um, that are included in this one as well for, for booster updates. Those are what's considered a chronic care hospital, right? I, be I believe that's, uh, I've seen that referred that way. You know, we're, we, in the first executive order, we refer to them as a state hospital employees. Um, and again, that's about 3,600. So that's a small piece of the, the puzzle here, but it is part of what's uh, being announced today. And is the state planning on um, organizing any clinics at the nursing homes or will the nursing home companies take this upon themselves to, to link up with say CVS or some other pharmacy, pharmacy organization? When we, uh, oh, sorry. I'm sorry, go ahead, Meg. No, I was just going to say when we, or prior to the holidays, we put a uh, joint effort with the state to try to get, uh, to put on booster clinics in all of the uh, 209 nursing homes throughout the state to ensure that the residents received boosters, the long-term care residents received boosters before the holidays it was very successful. And that was a combination of nursing homes working with their own long-term care pharmacies, being able to come in to run a clinic. If they had any difficulty, the Department of Public Health assisted them um, in any way possible to bring in a partner to be able to do the clinics. And we anticipate that to be a similar arrangement now where in working in partnership with the state as we've been doing throughout this pandemic. Okay, great. And I had just one more question for Dr. Juthani. Um, the last time I had spoken with you, um, I had asked about the monoclonal antibodies, and um, you said that there were uh, there was plenty of a supply. And then I have been getting emails from people saying they're having a really difficult time finding them. In particular, this one that I know I will butcher the name, but Sotro Vimab. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, and uh, I was wondering, you know. Are the hospitals that are on the call, are, are they providing these? Are they, how are people getting them? Are they able to get them? Is this something that you even want to provide given that Omicron seems to be taken over? So thank you for that question, Susan. And it did occur to me the last time after you asked it that you might have been asking specifically about Sotrovimab. So this is the <laughs> specific, this is the specific monoclonal antibody that we know works well against the Omicron variant. And unfortunately, some of the other monoclonal antibodies that we were using a lot of over the last many, many months are not effective against the Omicron variant. So to your point, we get a federal allocation every week of Sotrovimab, and we are not really accepting the other 
monoclonal antibody be, on antibodies, nor are they distributing them really much because they're not as effective. As you know, 91.5% of the variants that we have in the state are Omicron. So what we need is citrovimab. However, it is limited in its production and the state gets a certain allocation fr from the federal government. And from there, we work with the Connecticut Hospital Association to get doses out to hospitals that can be administered to patients. So we are limited by the amount that we are allocated as a state and then our hospital partners get allocation accordingly. Um, so I do know that this is a challenge for some people and that they want to have more access. Along those same lines, we do have the Paxlovid oral antiviral from Pfizer and also the Merck products that are allocated in a similar way from the federal government and then as we get more allocation, we can distribute it more widely across the state, including for these oral antivirals to pharmacies eventually. But we're just limited right now and waiting for more and more supply from the federal government. Okay, great. I didn't know if any of the other if the hospital representatives might want to say how available, how much this uh, monoclonal antibody is at their facilities. Jennifer could talk about the distribution. Yes, Jennifer. Yeah, I, the commissioner said it well. It's on, and by the way, we just call it Sotro. I think the commissioner, oh, it sounds the, only, the commissioner is the only one who can pronounce it. Um, it uh, it's distributed primarily by COVID census, and exactly as the commissioner said, it it is frustrating because it's um, what we have now for Omicron, and um, so we're looking forward to the to the anti the oral antivirals also. Okay, great. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, so. And our last question, Gabby Molina from Fox 61. Um, Governor, you mentioned that you're putting the mandate in place because while a lot of these employees are vaccinated fully, they're not boosted. Can anyone speak to what, why that might be? What is the reservation behind that if they're already vaccinated and it's been a requirement for their employment? I could. Hey, Matt, do you have any thought on that? Yeah, Governor, I think there's an exhaustion factor uh, that's coming into play here. That, uh, you know, we're, we're, it's nearly, uh, you know, it's two years or more that we've been through this pandemic, and our employees have uh, much has been asked of them, and they have accomplished extraordinary things. And I would say that, uh, in part due to the underlying vaccine mandate that the governor issued uh, our nursing home employees and, and assisted living communities really responded to the call. We, um, the underlying vaccination rates uh, are, are, are way over 90%. Uh, and that when we look at how do we get to that in combination of all the efforts of the nursing homes themselves to incent the vaccination rates, um, the governor's mandate, you can see this in the reporting, just the announcement of the governor's underlying vaccine mandate spiked the numbers, and we saw the numbers uh, of vaccine com compliance rise considerably as we moved to the initial deadline. It was extended once, but that's how we got to a 95% vaccination rate uh, um, amongst our employees. And I think there's every reason to believe that our nursing home uh, staff and assisted living communities are gonna to rise to the occasion once more. They're gonna to respond to the governor's call as indicated today in this, uh, in this new uh, updated mandate, uh, the third shot, if you will. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, going back to something Commissioner Gifford uh, said, she called it a toolbox. This is in the toolbox and it's probably the most important piece of, uh, or tool in this toolbox that is gonna get us to the other side of the pandemic. I think our employees are not gonna surprise us. Uh, and they are going to get to the, the highest, uh, uh, once more, uh, among the highest rates of nursing, uh, of uh, vaccine compliance in the nation here in Connecticut. Yeah, I think Matt said it really well. Um, okay, there is a little exhaustion factor. And my gosh, I got my two shots. I thought I was on the other side of this. You ought to remember that those two shots were extraordinarily effective, kept us with a very low infection rate for an awful long time. And uh, we have um, another couple of innings to go and the booster keeps you safe, keeps everybody in the game, allows you to go about your life safely, allows us to keep our schools open, allows us to keep our businesses open. And uh, that's why we're giving this one extra push. And uh, 
On a personal note, I want to say to my friends from the nursing homes and the hospitals, thank you. We can't do this if it's not a partnership. And working side by side with you now over, um, you know, close to three years has made a big difference. Take care, everybody. Thank you, Governor.